I like this photo because you see the amount of bikes and the streetcars. So you just sort of see how that actually that same street and the other image has has changed so much over time. And I like to show these images sometimes too because people think like, well, you know, roads are for cars. We've always done this. Like this is just the way it is. Like we can't carve space out for bikes, but to make this space for the cars, we carved that space out. So what? Who's to say we can't take a little bit back? Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns Podcast. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was Aaron Riediger from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, many of you may recognize that name. Uh, she was on the podcast before, back in the audio-only version. Erin's uh, got a fascinating history and background. Uh, she is a, a licensed architect and working in, in the architectural field. And uh, hey, it, it's a great conversation. It's a long one. So let's get right to it with Erin. Enjoy. It's a delight to have back on the podcast, Aaron Riediger. Aaron, how are you? I'm well, thank you, John. How are you? <laughs> I am well. And I, and I did <laughs> say welcome. <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's like I, I said welcome back because this is the second time on the podcast. This is so much mm-hmm. fun. And yeah, and then this time we're in uh, we're in video. Though, we're in so. full video, yes. <laughs> so uh, I think it was in season one uh, we had you on to talk about uh, your podcast, uh, and we'll we'll mention that and we'll talk a little bit about that podcast uh, then. And so I encourage folks to go back and listen to that first uh, you know episode to to really get more of a deep you know background uh, of who you are and and that whole podcast. And we'll uh, we'll reserve this to to talk about some fun new stuff. <laughs> so, but I will have you do like a little thirty second uh, introduction to uh, the video audience, and for those who haven't listened to the first one, uh, so I'll turn it over to you. Uh, who is Aaron Riediger, and and uh, what, what's what's your background? Yeah, so my name is Erin Riediger. I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is a mid sized. Um, city on the Canadian prairies in the middle of the country. Um, I'm an architect by trade, so I work at Prairie Architects, um, but I also on the side advocate for um, sustainable, equitable cities and good transportation networks. So I am the podcast host of a podcast mini series called Plain Bicycle, uh, which tells the story of a group of Canadians who went to the Netherlands to import Dutch bicycles to Canada as a way, as a means of um, trying to bring everyday transportation culture to North America. Yeah. And, and that's how you and I, you know, got connected was I started listening to that podcast. I'm like, oh, I've got to get Aaron on my podcast to talk about it. Uh, and because we have a lot of similar connections and friends, uh, you know, Chris and, and Melissa Bruntlett to, to, to uh, highlight right away. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so it was really, really neat. And uh, I spend a lot of time in the Netherlands going back and forth and, and um, uh, this particular podcast I believe this was in 2019, correct? Uh, 2020, it came okay, out. So I actually, uh, most of the recording was done pre, well, pretty much all of the recording was done pre-pandemic. So in okay. 2019. Right. Um, and I actually, before we I came on, I went back and listened to my own podcast again. And it was interesting because... Um, I actually recorded it while the project was taking place. So, uh, um, right. so it's it's recorded. Um, there's interviews before and after the fact, but also um, and during when when the, they were over in the Netherlands and actually during the launch party of yeah. the uh, of the project as well. And then so that was the launch was in the fall of 2019. And then actually right before the pandemic hit, I was finishing up all my editing, and and then it hit, and I wasn't sure when to release it because it seemed like all the new was just so pandemic focused and also like very heavy and important at the time. So I wasn't really sure. And then kind of, I think a few months into the pandemic, I thought it might be nice to have some levity and, and there was a renewed interest in cycling. So that's when I, when I decided to release it. Yeah. 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 It's, and it's such a, a a wonderful narrative. And, um, and I think I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to you to kind of describe, um, you know, sort of the creative process and the narrative that you pulled together, because it it really was a a truly wonderful storytelling opportunity. And uh, yeah, take it away. I mean, it was just such a beautifully done uh, story. 
Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so how I wanted to approach the podcast was to tell a, a self-contained story. And I knew um, Anders and Leanne just through just through the community, through like being interested in cycling. But I wasn't really a hardcore advocate um, in any particular way at the time. But I um, I did, did know of them and knew of the project. And I just thought it was such a interesting thing to do is to bring these Dutch bikes in and that they were used and, um, and they had, their story had been told in, in very brief in the local paper and they'd been on some news sites and, and people kind of knew about them, but I don't think it had been shared, um, widely. And I thought that, um, they're so passionate and it's such an interesting project that it would be really good to tell the story from start to finish from all the way from how they came up to it, how they actually acquired the bicycles and brought them over. Um, and, um, and, and then like to people, to people actually receiving the bicycles. Um, and I, and I quickly found that some of the most interesting parts of the story, at least for me, we're not, we're not sort of that summary that, oh yeah, they bring bicycles here so that we can have them. But actually how, when they initially went to the Netherlands, they, they had, this passion and this idea, but they didn't have a plan. And I think that's one of the really interesting things about um, Winnipeg Trails and, and Plain Bicycle Project is the people there are, are so passionate and they have really good ideas and they don't get encumbered by logistics. They just sort of figure it out. They just do the project. So yeah. I thought yeah. that's where it came from. Yeah, that's so cool. And you and you mentioned a, a big part of of the the narrative in the story was the the you know the side stories of the the sense of community and you know people discovering you know what a plain Dutch bicycle is and and really starting to you know embrace that that concept and and you see the smile on this this one person's face she's just like you know beaming uh, mm -hmm. you know as as she's pushing the the bike there and uh it's just it was such a fun overall story of of like you know the weaving together the you know the narrative of uh, the challenge to get the bikes and, and, and once you add the bikes, how are you going to get them over? And then once you get them over, it's like how, how you're going to get them together. And, and so, yeah, I, I encourage everybody to do that. Now here's, here's the, the, the main question I have for you about that podcast, because mm -hmm. people keep asking me about it and they're <laughs> like, uh, when is she going to do another one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I have gotten that question and I think I put pressure on myself about that a lot. Um, I would like to do more podcasting cause it was really a joy for me, but as I'm sure you understand from doing a podcast, the time and energy it takes is, is quite a bit. Um, and the last year I was, uh, I recently became a registered architect. So that was on, I don't want to make excuses for not, you know, getting into the podcasting, but that was an undertaking with all the exams and everything that it, that involves. So I would like to sort of um, tell more stories or continue this story, but I haven't really figured out um, sort of the best the best avenue for that. Um, so I would say stay tuned, follow me on Twitter, and and I should um, I should figure out what I what I want to do next soon. But um, it's a little bit up in the air right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. And you mentioned work, and and uh, so you work for for Prairie Architects, mm -hmm. and uh, this is your website there. Um, talk a little bit about um, that passion and drive uh, for be becoming an architect. What really led you into that, you know, career path? Yeah, so it's actually interesting what led me directly to architecture specifically because I was working as uh, an interior designer. Like I'd always been interested in design generally and um, and a creative field. So I started working um, as an I, I actually started going through school and I, I picked the interior design stream and, and I was more largely interested. I used to uh trained to be a dancer when I was younger. So I okay. wanted to do something creative, but that was a little more career oriented. So then I got into um, design. Um, but then what made me interested in making a switch to becoming an architect um, was just the way that buildings affect cities. So the first few times I traveled to Europe and really saw um, how the the building fabric and the urban environment can influence sort of the livability, the walkability of a city and, um, 
and the accessibility of a city, I, I thought, well, I'd really like to um, help be help build that and be a part of that. And I think that um, then that sort of spiraled into my interest about uh, transportation, um, which has always been for me about equity as well as sustainability. So um, working for Prairie Architects, like one of the main focuses of the uh, practice is uh, sustainable buildings and community buildings. So um, I, I, I wanted to do work that's, um, you know, work is work, but it's also somewhat uh, meaningful because you are, um, you are affecting the way people live and the way um, they interact with the street as well as the building is, is important to people's everyday lives. So, um, so yeah, when I, I recently took a position as an architect at Prairie Architects, who has a, is a leader in the sustainability field and sustainable buildings, I thought that was a great fit for someone who's interested in um, sustainable and equitable transportation as well. Right, right. And I pulled up this picture. This is a, a picture mm-hmm. of your uh, of your work, and it looks like there's a little uh, bike room there. And I think that's a wonderful place to talk about the significance of architecture and buildings. And um, Mark uh, Wackenberg with uh, Bicycle Dutch, uh, he and I ta- had this conversation about how they're starting to really clamp down on the architectural design of buildings in making sure that uh, um you know, bike parking is included so that the bikes aren't left outside to, you know, <laughs> to rust and, you know, be in the elements, yeah. you know, there, there should have, you should have the ability. And so uh, they, they, you know, to be able to bring your bike indoors so that it, especially with the, the more expensive bikes, it's in a safe location. Talk a little bit about how significant that is from an architectural perspective of thinking about, planning, especially when you're talking about commercial buildings and community Mm -hmm. buildings, as well as residential. Yeah. So this is an interesting image, actually, because um, it's in my office and it's not a side bike room, but it's actually our front lobby. So the door that you see on the side there, the uh, vestibule is actually, um, this is the entrance. So if I'm having this view in the office, I'm actually sitting at the reception desk and looking at the the bike wall. So um, the idea of it, and this was designed before I, um, before I came to the firm, but the idea of it was that um, it's, it's not uh, bike parking had to be integrated because the building um, or the, the interior is, is lead, lead certified. So it was, it was a part of that, but um, instead of putting that into a side room, the idea was to make it a feature so that um, it, it celebrates that sustainable transportation aspect rather than putting it in, in, in a side room. And it does make it so much easier coming and going at work and bringing your bike inside the building. You know, like I always have that debate. Do I just, especially cause I have a cheaper Dutch bike that's harder to steal. I'm like, do I just leave it outside? It's just much easier, but they make it so easy. Like mine um, doesn't quite go up on the bike wall because it is so gonna, heavy. I and I always say it's funny because the other <laughs> the other guys that ride their bikes to work in the morning, they actually carry them this vestibules up a set of stairs. It's in an old um, warehouse a district uh, in the exchange district. It's an old warehouse building. They they carry them up the stairs. They put them on the wall. But um, I actually take mine in the accessible entrance in the back and wheel it. And then I just like I just leave it there. Like and it was funny because my first day I was like oh, I don't think I can get this on the wall. And they were just like yeah just just park it there. Like it's fine. Just so yeah. I just my bar- bike is right in the front entrance. Um, but yeah, I think it's becoming um, especially actually in, in residential developments, it's becoming more and more of a considered an amenity rather than like, oh, this extra space we have to account for. And, and especially in residential where every square foot is is um, is thought of as as uh, income that you can gain back when you're developing a building. Now developers are seeing that there's a there's a there's a need for bi- safe bike parking. And it's something that tenants are actually looking for when they're looking for um, rentals in, in urban neighborhoods and homes in urban neighborhoods. So so providing safe bike parking is more and more important. And, you know, in in um, in, in education buildings, even it's becoming something that's important for staff as well as students. And um, whether it's covered on the site or integrated into the building, it, it is, I think, an important part of architecture is thinking about not just how if people drive that there's a, there's a parking count, but also how do we promote um, different types of transportation? 
Yeah, I mean that you just hit it right there. I I always uh, look at things from the standpoint of helping shape and promote behavior, the behavior that we'd like to see, and the behavior that helps uh, you know support the sustainable uh, you know things that we need to move forward. And and, and this is a big part of it. I mean, it's, again, I'll say it again. You know, uh, you know, especially for for those people who may have a bike that might be a little bit more expensive. Maybe they've uh, needed to go to an electric assist bike because their distance or, or because of some other condition or age or whatever. Um, and they're like, yeah, I mean, having that ability to have a secure bike parking uh, situation is, is critical because, you know, as we all know, bike theft is, is really rampant right now. Um, mm-hmm. And I, and I think that that's so critical too. You, you said a couple things there that, that made me think about how, um, parking minimums and parking in general, when you think of, of car parking and, and the things that ha- you know, end up shaping our built environment, not just the, the, the community itself, but also the buildings. Uh, one of the, the photos that, uh, we did, uh, with Mark's, uh, interview is we did a compare and contrast of a typical Dutch home that has integrated bike parking and then a typical North American home with the car parking. And he was just like, look at this. There's, there's almost more space for the car than there is for living, you know, for the people. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, you, you start to realize, oh yeah, you know, one car park, lo- you know, space, you know, you could, mm-hmm. you know, theoretically easily, you know, in, in this configuration, get six bikes into a single parking spot. And then with other configurations, you can get even more. So when you ta- talk about that, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. And when you think about the amount of space we give over to car parking and then how much those cars are actually used, I've been thinking about that a lot because I'm actually a part of a, like I do have to drive on occasion and I'm a part of a car share in in my city and, um, it's just so much more efficient because the car's pretty much always into use, except probably like very late at night when it's not, I mean, it's not always in use, but it's definitely in use. A lot people sharing a car is is in use a lot more than someone driving it to work, leaving it there all day and then, and then driving it home to a new spot and leaving it there all night. Um, and, and it really like talking about active towns, active cities, it, it really allows a car share allows people to get rid of that personal vehicle. Because for me personally, even someone who's very passionate about active transportation, biking, especially, but also um, I do take the bus and walk. Like if I didn't have access to a car share, I would still likely be a car owner. Right. Right. And, and if I remember correctly, you did some fun financial analysis about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did. So um, it's interesting when you do look at like the true cost of car ownership. And I thought I found it especially interesting recently with the rising gas prices. Um, So people are all of a sudden freaking out about how much it costs to drive. And then when you do the math, like it's only incrementally more than what they're already paying a month, but they already think of like the car as a need, not as a you know, a want or a nice to have. So it's everything that goes into that car besides the gas they think of as a sunk cost. Mm -hmm. So they only are thinking about that small little incremental rise in the gas price. Um, But I looked at in Canada, the average price of um, owning a Honda Civic that's a couple years old, which is a small car. And most people nowadays, like at we can look around and see own a much larger vehicle as their standard vehicle, but a Honda Civic alone would cost you 700 to $800 a month. And that's not including parking, parking costs. Um, so that includes everything from the cost of the vehicle, maintenance, gas, um, and insurance. So, um, when you're really doing that math, um, the, uh, I think it was, 25 to $35 a day you're paying for your vehicle. And sometimes it's just sitting there. So mm-hmm. when you, when I think about car share, I probably in the winter when it's heavier use, I'm driving two or three times a week for a few hours. And it's like, you know, 10 to $20, depending on how long I ride it. So then, you know, my monthly car share, even in the really cold winter here, it was, it was minus 30 Celsius. I'm not sure if that is in, in Fahrenheit, but I was using it a lot more and my bills were still only coming to a hundred to $120 a month. And then it really evens out in the summer when I'm using it less. So, yeah. um, 
So yeah, I think there's some math that uh, there's some funky math people do to justify their car ownership sometimes. And just to be clear, you don't always drive in the winter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think I consider this Winnipeg winter in this photo. This is yes. like this is probably like fall, fall or spring here. <laughs> just, just a light dusting. Yeah, just, just a light, a light dusting. dusting. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's probably only minus ten here. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. So this is a great shot. So this is your 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 bike that you got from uh, you got yes. the Gazelle. Nice. Yeah, so that's my uh, my plane bicycle I got through round two of the project. So in the podcast, I actually go through that because it was interesting when I first started recording the story, I wanted to do a story about them, but I didn't actually have a Dutch bike. I had like another kind of upright city bike and oh, I thought it was like fine, like it's good. It's It's basically a Dutch bike in my head. Um, but then when they brought them back and I started riding them around the warehouse space that they were uh, fixing them in, I was like, oh, like this is, this is different. This is not your North American city bike. Like this is really comfy. It's cozy. I'm super upright. Like I'm super high up and, um, it, it's a totally different feel than the ones you get in North America. And then I was like, you know, I'm doing this whole recording. I'm doing this project. Like, why don't I just get one? Like they're $350. Like I just should get one. And now my poor little pink city bike rarely gets used. I do use it in the winter now though, because I couldn't get, um, winter tires for a, for a Dutch bike because they right. just don't get enough snow to sell, um, studded tires in that right. size. So yeah, I do, yeah. my, my other bike is still, you know, it still gets some love now and then, but, um, the Dutch bike has just become this, um, it's just, I, it's taken over in terms of like the joy of riding a bike that I, I, yeah. um, I don't ride another kind often yeah. at all. Yeah, and, and it's great you sent a, along this little anatomy of an Oma Feats. Uh, explain mm -hmm. what an Oma Feats is. Yeah, so an Oma Feats literally translates to grandma bike. So um, sometimes, like, I've heard people calling them, like, grandma bikes, dis bikes disparagingly in, um, in North America, but they kind of like wear it as a badge of pride. Like you do drive slower in it. It's just about getting from A to B conveniently easy and lots and being able to carry stuff. So an Oma Feats is, um, it's actually derived from the English safety bicycle, which was popular in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and it was invented in England and brought over to the growing quickly growing metropolises in, in North America and other places in the world. And the interesting thing about the Dutch is, well, other places in the world, um, the bike evolved. We made it lighter. We made it faster. We made it sportier. Um, the Dutch pretty much just kept the design exactly the same. <laughs> so um, what makes this bike so special is that it isn't special, that it's super just, it's super practical and it has everything, every accessory um, that you need on it to just drive um, anywhere in normal clothing. So the fenders, which is totally key. Like even we've had a lot of rain this past week and like people I'm talking to at work about biking, they kind of make that decision in the morning, depending on how much rain. And I, I was just joke. I'm like, I'm immune. Like I have fenders. I'm immune to rain. I don't care. Like I'm not going to get that strip up my back. Um, the headlamp and the rear light are actually integrated usually on the bicycle. Um, the curved back handlebars allow that really upright posture and, and casual, like you're not you're not um even on my other city bike i do find like i'm using my arms more as i'm biking and on this right. you're just they're just sort of placed and then the bikes um in this image it does have a handbrake and mine personally does have a secondary handbrake but the but the main brake and most of them just have our um coaster brakes or back pedal brakes um which can help you control your speed as well as as help you stop um right. a big thing about them is their step through frames so there's no like this is a girl's bike this is a boy's bike they're just most i mean you can get the opa feats with a crossbar if you want to feel super masculine um but uh, but most of them are just like you just step on and step off and that makes it super easy for clothing or clo uh, yeah clothing or if you're um, loading stuff on the back you're not going to kick you're not going to kick anything and then you've got your your rear rack integrated but it's like it's like a it's like a hardy rear rack like I added a rear rack to my other bike and it's a bit flimsy like this right. you can really load stuff on um, and then yeah the saddle is super comfortable the chain guard and the skirt guard so that you don't you can wear like any pants you can wear long skirts like that was sort of game changing for me because um, I like to you know I like to dress up for work I like to wear skirts and you don't have to change when you get to work which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. 
We'll, we'll linger on this just a, a little bit more <laughs> because I think there's some really neat comparisons that are here. Uh, the whole point of the of the plane bicycle is uh, is that it is just so incredibly pragmatic and ordinary. Hence the name, the plane bicycle project, and the plane bicycle. It's just a plane bicycle, but. It's more than just a plain bike bicycle because, as you mentioned, it pretty much has everything that you could possibly need. And so when you buy a bike <laughs> from, you know, over there in the Netherlands, you're not having to add a whole bunch of extras. I mean, it already mm -hmm. has the front running light. It's got the rear, you know, these are safety features that are that are on there and the safety feature of that chain guard you're not getting stuff you know not only you're not getting the oil on there but you're also you know not getting you know fabric caught in the chain which could be dangerous because it could cause a crash so there's just all these wonderful pragmatic features to this bike and it's it's not like you have to do a lot of extra steps to to bring it up to speed um and when we compare you know, sort of this approach to the anatomy of what it looks like when we, in North America, where we sort of outfit ourselves to uh, to go out and do just normal everyday plain bicycle riding, it ends up looking much different. You've got all the, you know, the safety features of, you know, you know, helmets and glasses and reflective clothing and and all this kind of stuff and we don't need to get into a, a massive debate about all that kind of stuff but it just yeah. it's it's interesting how different the that that aesthetic is and and the approach to it um because there's something just absolutely beautiful and wonderful about just feeling like you can dress for your your destination and you know like you said you you like to dress up and ride your bike yeah like i think that it's just it, it's it's the simplicity of it it's that you don't need to go to i don't know if you have mountain equipment co-op here or there but we always joke about mec like you don't have to go to mec and get all the accessories and get all the you know the gear you can you can just get on your bike and if you are the type of guy who like loves the gear, you feel safer in a helmet, you feel safer in a reflective vest. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Right. The main point is that it's not necessary and that we have this sort of culture that you need to kit yourself out to, to bet, to like go off to battle or go to a construction site just to like get around. Like, you know, you don't do that if you're a pedestrian, like right. car, like people on your bike should be treated the same way. You're just normal people going from one point to another. Like why have we developed this culture that it's the only type of transportation where you're supposed to wear a different outfit to do or, and it, and it prevents people from cycling. It prevents people, more people from cycling because it makes it a thing. You're not just getting in your car and going to work. You're, I got to change my outfit. I got to take a shower. I got to, you know, on this bike, you don't need to do that because you just don't, you, you approach it even like just using it. You're like, I don't really want to go fast. I don't need to go fast. What's right. the point? Yeah. So yeah. Good stuff. That's great. And you know, it, it's, you, you mentioned it too, in terms of the, the, the construction, the anatomy of the Oma feats. Um, I notice this whenever I'm over in, in the Netherlands, it's like, men are riding o oma feats at, at just mm -hmm. the same rate that you know that women are so it's not it's not gender specific over there uh it's it's just a practical and pragmatic thing especially and i i i tweeted about this the other day i was like i i wish my bike you know was in in the shape of uh, oma feats with a step through frame mm -hmm. you know because i'm always packing something in my rear panniers that are sticking up like either my um like a big loaf of bread or, you know, or, uh, what was I, what did I have the other day? Um, oh, my, uh, my camera stand, you know, so I have my tripod, you know, sticking up out of there and I've swing my leg over, oh, I'm hitting the, that, you know, it's like, yeah. oh, I wish I had a step through frame. It's so simple and so, uh, easy. So yeah, anyways, mm -hmm. we could, we could go on and on and on about that <laughs> good, good, good stuff. But I, I wanted to, to bring back some of the, the images of just how impactful that was because it was about a cultural shift. I mean, I think you even called it like a, 
was it a culture bomb or something like that? Was yeah, one of the, culture bomb. Yeah, yeah, that was that was Anders words that this yeah. is not a bike shop. This is a culture bomb. <laughs> Talk a little bit about how, I mean, because now we're, you know, a a few years into this, uh, a couple years, solid years into this now. What's the scene like there in Winnipeg? I I believe that they're there now because I keep seeing tweets uh, from the Netherlands. So I I get the sense that they might be getting some more bikes. Is that the case? Yeah. So um, Anders and Leanne are currently in the Netherlands and they're like in their true fashion, a little bit mysterious about what they're going to bring back or not bring back, (laughs) which is, which is, you know, just them. But they're also, I think, gathering a lot of data, like they're taking a lot of photo, they're taking a lot of video um, and just sharing, uh, sharing the differences there and just trying to get the word out um, after experiencing the bikes here, just so, because I think it's one thing to go there and see that and then come home and then not have the bike here and just sort of be on normal bikes with our like sort of subpar infrastructure and 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 really conceptualize what some of the things that can be different are so now that they're living so much here with the uh, in Winnipeg with the Dutch bikes now going there they're able to have that sort of okay this this experience is different like what can we do for change and and it is ever evolving in the Netherlands too it's interesting talking to Herbert Tiemens about that because you yeah. think like oh they're perfect like this is what we should emulate, but they're constantly making improvements. They're constantly learning. They're constantly developing better ways to, um, to make the cities more bike friendly and increase the mode share even more. Um, so, uh, yeah, basically the evolution of it is that there have been, so there was a third shipment after the second shipment during COVID because basically they went over their, right when COVID hit. And I think I talk about that in the sixth episode, which was an, an initially not planned, but an add-on episode about the pandemic and how biking was changing um, quickly. But um, so then that was kind of done in this similar way to the others where, you know, you had, um, it was a little bit of a lottery, you got the bike that you got, but then there was additionally in that shipment, so many extra bikes that they were able to sell them sort of one off after. And then since they were able to make a partnership with a company in the Netherlands that actually is able to pack up the bikes for them and send them here um, and then sell them. So now there's actually, it's interesting because the tagline of the first podcast was, uh, it's not a, this isn't a bike shop, but now they do have a bike shop. Yeah which is called the bicycle garden. So it's, um, and I mean, it's, it's a social enterprise. It's not a traditional retail that they're, they're not, they're not trying to make profit for profit's sake. It's, it's, it supports, uh, the profits support the programs of Winnipeg trails and plain bicycle and getting, uh, improving Winnipeg in the active transportation in Winnipeg. So it's not that it's, a, it's not a, it's not a business enterprise as much, but, um, there is a shop that you can actually go to. Cause they did find that I think the, there's people like you and I that would buy, buy into this instantly and be like, yeah, here's my money. I'll, I'll get a bike. Like this makes total sense. But I think a lot of people, it is so different than what we're used to. Like we're used to the bike being this sort of like precious fancy thing that should be pristine. So it was, it's definitely a hard sell to give people a rusty bike that they don't know what it's going to look like. So, um, the shop allows people to actually try them out and, and in some cases even, even pick one as they're getting repaired so that they feel a little bit more comfortable with the purchase. And then as a part of that, they actually, some people, just don't want a used bike, which is fair. So now they've started to import new bikes. So new, like actual Dutch Oma feet, not North Americanized versions of them. Um, They do sell, those usually sell pretty quickly. So I have a feeling they're gonna be bringing some more over, but, um, and then recently also uh, they are able to import work cycles now and and also some box bikes. So some back back feats Mm -hmm. and they also, um, made a partnership with, um, um, I can never pronounce the name Chris, Christian, the free, the free state in Copenhagen, which oh, right. I, however yeah. you pronounce that. Yeah. Uh, Chris, um, Christiana, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. So they, um, they actually make their own version of a, of a box bike that you see, um, all over Copenhagen and sell there. Um, and they were able to import some of those as well. Um, and I believe the way those work is that you get the frame and then you kind of make the box yourself. Um, so yeah, this is actually a, a free little library near my place, near the entrance to the river trail 
where I, I just kind of came across a Bach Feats. And so you are seeing some of them now in Winnipeg, which is really interesting. Um, I wouldn't say they have the saturation that we want <laughs> quite yet, um, but it used to be like a rare occurrence that you would see a Dutch bike because it was one or two shipments. And a lot of people, you know, unfortunately kind of they bought them and it's a little more of a novelty, but now you're seeing a lot more people that are buying them because they want this to be their everyday uh, everyday bicycle. So it, it is shifting. I'd say it's shifting slowly because I don't want to, you know, put a negative spin on it, but there have been more people biking the last few days because our last few weeks, it's, it's finally been warmer here. We had a really long winter this year, but the prevalent culture is still very much that sort of like aggressive. I want to go as fast as I can. I need the fastest, lightest bike possible. Like, mm-hmm. you know, as I'm toddling along on the bike lane, you do get passed by some pretty aggressive cyclists and, yeah. I mean, I want to love everyone. We're all cyclists. We're all doing the same thing. But at the same time, you can just tell still that there's sort of this like pressure of like you're on a bike and you should be going as fast as you can and on the most efficient machine possible. So um, but I do think the more and more people see people in regular clothes riding these Oma feats, it is starting to change people's minds. I even had someone at work said that she uh, didn't know me before I started working there and she saw me on Twitter and I actually inspired her to get a bike because she was like, I didn't really want to wear like, you know, she's like, I didn't want to get the clothes and do the whole thing. But she was like, I saw you were just wearing normal clothes. I saw a picture of you on Twitter wearing normal clothes, biking to work. And I thought maybe I could do that. So I think it's kind of that slow, slow trickle to get more people on bikes that wouldn't normally consider it. Yeah. Yeah. Now you sent over a couple of uh, quotes from uh, Chris and Melissa's new book, uh, Curbing Traffic, which is just an mm-hmm. absolutely fabulous book. Um, everybody, make sure that you uh, you you pick up a copy. Um, it's uh, published from Island Press, and uh, y- you said something just there about you know kind of the the that ethic around you know the aggressiveness of of even riding and and it. And it in a weird way, it made me think of this this quote in terms of the economic uh, man theory. Uh, mm-hmm. Why did you share this? What what was significant yeah, so about this? I recently had to like do some thinking and um, get together uh, some slides for a talk that I did um, just locally here in Winnipeg, and I was trying to think about like what to talk about because I feel like I've talked about the Plain Bicycle Project so much and. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of the things we don't think of when we think of transportation, like we make all these arguments for cycling, like, oh, it's it's better for the environment. Um, you know, you get some exercise. Uh, it takes up less physical space than a car, all these. But we don't really think about like the human spirit at all and like what what makes you feel good. Like and <laughs> it's interesting with these conversations with COVID and like, you know, you talk to people and why they're staying home f- or why they want to stay home. And and for people, it's all sorts of reasons. And, and the world of work is changing. But a lot of people say that they don't like the commute. They admit, don't miss the commute. It was expensive. It was a hassle. They hated being in traffic. And for me, it was like the total opposite. Like the commute is my favorite part of the day. And I think when we think about commuting or getting to work, getting to and from things, we're like trying to think of the most efficient and quickest way to do that. And right maybe we don't have to do that. Like maybe that's not the best things thing for us as human beings. Um, so I thought that this part of Melissa and Chris's book was interesting because they, yeah, they talk about how, um, the, the, it, it has to do with like the cubicle farms and, and everything and how people, um, we've been designing around, Uh, our workspaces and our commute around people being the most efficient possible at work. Like they can get, get there in the shortest amount of time, they do the most work and then they can come home. And even when people talk about the extra time they gained at home, working from home, they're like, Oh, I can do the dishes now for half an hour right after work. I can, I can clean my house. I can, I can exercise. And it's like, for me, it's like, I get, you know, 15 minutes to half an hour where I'm just riding my bike. I'm decompressing from my day. I'm, I'm, feeling joy. I'm having joy in my commute. Like the commute doesn't need to be this sort of like dark and, um, this, this annoying thing. It it can be something that you find joy in. And and maybe that's maybe if, even if it isn't the quickest way, that's, that's okay. Cause it's good for us. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And, and, and I was reflecting too on, um, you know, with, with Chris and Melissa, you know, during the pandemic there in Delft, uh, you know, they were both working from home. And so they ended up walking a lot more. And so they mm-hmm. ended up really 
getting to know their city at a at a much more intimate level because they were constantly walking and you know that slower pace means it's a more intimate connection with your 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 surrounding and your and your uh, your environment um, and I think that what you had just said, you know, is, is really sort of captured a little bit on this is is the the happiness and that that concept of wasted time. And I'm glad you mentioned that you, you sort of missed that commute, too, because that's that's the joy side of it. It's it, it and that's the that kind of the difference that we were describing earlier of the, the typical North American approach to, to, to riding a bike to get to, from one place to the next and the aggressiveness that takes place with that versus, no, 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 I'm on a casual upright bike and I'm going to just relax and I'm going to take things in and I'm going to notice things and there's a joyfulness to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that that really, you know, kind of reinforces what you were talking about with the, the, the healthiness and the wellness and the happiness, you know, to that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so, <laughs> talking about aggressiveness, uh, <laughs> you had something really strange happen to you in in April. Um, I'll pull it up on Twitter here, but but tell tell the audience what what the heck happened. Yeah, so um, I was riding my bike to work, like I do pretty much every day, and um, there's a part in my commute where. I have to change lanes to turn left um, down another street because the bike lane is on the right hand side of the street. And there's just like no way to cross over because the bike lane just continues into the next intersection. So I always enter the car traffic and, and pull over. And I usually like I'm I'm not an aggressive fast cyclist at all. So I fully like cross the street, wait till all the cars go. I don't even try to signal in or weave through them. I'm just like, all right, now they're gone. Now I get behind them and go along my merry way. And, um, this pedestrian actually, which also shocks people (laughs) stepped out and, uh, in front of my bike, as I was trying to change lanes and hit me and said, the bike lane basically told me the bike lanes over there. Like, um, yeah, like slapped me because I wasn't in the bike lane. Um, and it really like sort of shocked me and, and shook me up, but it also made me realize just like, like how much people hate cyclists for no really good reason. Like, um, and the, and he was jaywalking across the street. Like I was fully allowed to be in a car lane. A bike is allowed to, like you almost second guess what you did after, because, you know, I do sometimes pull moves that are not a hundred percent legal for my own safety or convenience. Like right. I think because there's just not, Like it's not, we aren't Copenhagen. We aren't, uh, we aren't the Netherlands. We don't have the proper infrastructure. You have to improvise sometimes. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was just, it was quite, it was quite shocking and disturbing to have someone actually physically assault me for not, uh, performing as they would like me to. And, and basically taking up space, um, didn't like the way I was taking up space. Yeah. Yeah. And who knows? We we don't, we can't even we can speculate, but we don't really know what was going on in his mind and whether, you know, he was mentally stable. We, who knows? You know, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What what I appreciated um, from that whole thing, you know, playing out on Twitter is that the amount of people who came to your defense and really were quite supportive of you is like nearly 2000 people, you know, liked it. And many, many people, you know, commented, I know you had to end, end up <laughs> turning notifications off on it yeah. because it got overwhelming. Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, the positive side of there's a lot of negativity out on social media and in, as well as out on the streets, but overwhelmingly, uh, people were very, very positive and supportive. And so it was wonderful. It was heartening to see that. And uh, partly the reason why I reached out to you and said, hey, let's get you yeah. back on the podcast and talk about yeah. uh, what's new with you. So um, that that was not fun, yeah. but it was it was good that it, it got us uh, reconnected. So. Yeah. You don't, you don't mess with bike Twitter. I always like <laughs> makes me laugh so hard when people don't know that and they make some stupid comment about bikes and it's like, Oh, you should not have tweeted that. Like you don't yeah. know what's coming at you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's so true. So one of the fun things that you uh, were involved with recently was 
uh, something called a scavenger hunt, and you 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 did this in in uh, I guess it was the downtown area. Uh, mm-hmm. Set this up, and then we'll 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 play a little video uh, interview video clip of you. Yeah, so I volunteer with um, the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation um, here, and uh, basically our goal is to preserve the uh, history of Winnipeg architecture that's that's a little more contemporary, like beyond the historical societies. And then it's also to just get people um, engaged in architecture and sort of uh, and interested in it. So what the activity was, it was called Hidden Winnipeg, and um, people met up in the Exchange District and were given a series series of clues. And then they had to go around and uh, figure out everything from what specific buildings were to like little details on the buildings. And then they came back to us with the answers and and we gave out prizes. So it was just a way to get people to um, engage with the city and walk around the exchange district in a different way. Cool. And uh, we've got this queued up. So let's go ahead and uh, hit play and and, uh, see you on camera here. The Architecture Foundation is hosting a scavenger hunt. I'm joined by a board member, Erin Riediger. Is going to tell us a little bit about it? Good morning. Good morning. So why are you guys doing it? How did it all get started? So the scavenger hunt is a way to get people to experience uh, architecture in Winnipeg in a fun way. So um, basically we'll all meet here at Old Market Square on Saturday and um, people will get a series of questions to go around the area by bike, by foot or um, whatever you need for your own mobility to um, answer a series of questions and explore the architecture in Winnipeg as well as details in the buildings. And that's what it's all about, really kind of discovering the hidden gems. I know that there's other hidden gems outside of this scavenger hunt. Can you tell us about them? Yeah, so outside of the scavenger hunt, Winnipeg Architecture Foundation has a series of tours, which you can find on our website. We have tour events where we actually have tour guides that take people around different areas to exp- or explore different types of architecture. And then we also have some publications. So the two publications I have here are our most recent ones. So we have the Ghost Signs Walking Tour as well as the Osborne Village Architecture Tour. And you can buy these um, through the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation. Um, our website is Winnipeg Architecture architecture.ca and we also have an office here in the exchange with a small shop so basically what these books are are they give you uh, self-guided tours um, but they're also just really nice books to have if you don't physically go on the tour just to learn a little bit more about Winnipeg and some of the architectural elements. Do you have any favorite parts of the city? Yeah, I have two favorite parts. So I would say my own neighborhood and my work neighborhood. My work neighborhood is the Exchange District, and I love walking around at lunch because I always discover new hidden gems like you will on the scavenger hunt. And my other favorite neighborhood is um, I live around Osborne Village and the Cordon area and everything in between. And again, I love that it's so walkable and there's so many things to discover. Fabulous. And this weekend, the scavenger hunt is taking place. There's going to be a link on our website if you're interested in checking it out. <laughs> well, that was so much fun. And uh, it, it was it was neat, too, to, to hear you talking about, you know, how much you enjoy the, the neighborhoods and, and being able to walk around. Uh, for those people who have never been up there, talk a little bit about Winnipeg. Okay, so, um, well, Winnipeg is, it's an interesting city because um, it was uh, basically a a rail, uh, it was, well, it was a trading post in the days of the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, So it's always been a place for trade and commerce. And then it was um, a really important uh, place in the, the turn of the century. So a lot of the buildings in the Exchange District and downtown um, are, are, that are still there are these very extravagant um, turn of the century buildings. Um, so it's sometimes called the Chicago of the North, actually. Um, and then basically what happened was when trade routes changed, Winnipeg became less important. It became less of a port. So uh, there was a little bit of a period of decline. And then there was a boom again in the um, in the 1960s and 70s with a period of, of modernism. And there's a really... Um, 
well-known architecture school at the University of Manitoba here, um, where there were some pretty prominent mid-century uh, architects uh, that that taught architecture here, and then a series of um, as firm of architecture firms that came came out of that. Um, so we have these, and then now again, it's starting to starting to grow, but it's always been a very slow growth city. So. Um, why some sometimes the slow growth makes it a, a challenging city in the way that um, we don't have the explosions in population and density that other cities do. Um, it has allowed us to maintain some things that would have otherwise probably been torn down in the name of progress. So our exchange district is this, um, I think one of the, if not the largest, one of the largest like collections of um of buildings from that era from turn of the century warehouses essentially like in the world. And it's despite the, there's some that were torn down and, and became surface parking lots. There is quite a collection of these old warehouse buildings. And that I think that if you're from here, you kind of take it for granted. Like that is where my, my office actually is. And a lot of them are converted into offices and residential now. Um, and then, um, and then, yeah, we have, we have so many architects here and there is like such a passion for architecture that there is um, for being such a small city. We are a big hitter with the, with the, in the architecture community um, in Canada. And I think like around the world. Um, so that's what makes it interesting. We have these extreme temperature fluctuations. Like people always talk about how cold it gets here in the winter, which it certainly does. We get a ton of snow. It gets minus 30 Celsius, but we also have these amazing summers where it's plus 30 and it's super hot so we experience all the seasons to the absolute extreme um yeah we have like these old interesting buildings interspersed with the problems that come with sprawl um and there's just and there's also like i think one of the biggest interesting things about uh winnipeg is even though it's a smaller or it's it's a mid-sized city where i think we're about eight hundred thousand now um we have these really well-known arts organizations. So we have the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. We have the Royal uh, Manitoba Theater Center. So you can see world-class theater, uh, dance, um, and symphony in this, in the city, uh, which is amazing as well as like all these other really small, uh, theater groups and artists. And because it's main, it's maintained its affordability because of the lack of growth, uh, or, or the slow, the, the pace of the growth, um, artists can still find a place here and find a career here and, and be able to afford to live. Yeah. Yeah. I pulled this picture up just because it's an interesting mashup. We've got the Dutch bike yeah. you know, here <laughs> in a bike lane and, you know, uh, on you know, what looks like a strode here. And then, you know, some of the more modern uh, buildings in the background. And uh, I think we've got a photo of some of the old. Yeah, we do have a, an old building um, a photo here, which is just, you know, a, a little mm -hmm. bit of a taste of what old Winnipeg used to look like. And, and you're saying some of the old historic architecture, maybe not on, not these specifically these buildings, but some of it mm -hmm. is still in existence. Yeah. Most of these buildings in this photo are actually still there. Wonderful. Um, this is, this is main street. Um, yeah. Like that strip is mostly intact. Actually, there's a few that are, there's a few teeth missing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, you can see most of this view today. And, uh, so that's main street in Winnipeg. And actually the other photo I think was also, it was maybe portage. It was, no, it was main street as well. So it was actually, in, it was a little bit of a different vantage point, uh, turned the other uh -huh. way, but it was, um, it's actually the same, the same street in, in, and close to the same location. Um, and so this is, I like this photo because you see the amount of bikes and the streetcars. So you just sort of see how that actually that same street and the other image has, has changed so much over time. And I like to show these images sometimes too, because people think like, well, you know, roads are for cars. We've always done this. Like, this is just the way it is. Like we can't carve space out for bikes, but to make this space yeah. for the cars, we carved that space out. So what, who's to say we can't take a little bit back. Yeah. Well, and, and when I see an image like this and, 
and uh, and when I see an image like the previous image, and the first thing that kind of comes up is, oh my gosh, look at how huge this right of way is. I mean, there's it's just a massive, massive you know stretch of asphalt. It's so wide, and then you see this, and you're like, oh well, there was a reason why it was so wide. It was truly mm-hmm. a multimodal <laughs> corridor. You've got your streetcars running. You've got you know bikes out there. Uh, there's even a little car right there. You know, probably from the 19 teens. And mm-hmm. so, it, yeah, I mean, there was a reason why this boulevard, this main street, was as wide as it was, is because it was truly a multimodal corridor. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. I love seeing the you know, the compare and contrast. And I love your framing of that too, of saying that, well, actually, no, it wasn't built just for cars. Let me show you the photo. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, and I think it it comes into this conversation that, uh, about sustainability and gas prices and all that. And people are like, well, we got to get electric cars, electric cars. There's, that's the solution. And, um, it shows that maybe new technology isn't actually the way, like we used to be able to do these things very simply. Um, Yeah. So maybe we just, you know, we don't want (laughs) to, I said, I posted that on Twitter and someone was like, well, you don't want to rewind because you know, there was poverty and no women's rights. And I was like, I wasn't like literally saying we all go back to 1890. (laughs) I was just saying, I'd like the streetcars and the bikes, please. (laughs) Well, and and one of the things that you pulled together for me was, was really funny. Are you probably didn't pull this together for me. You, you had probably had this out already, but uh, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of years about the whole concept of, uh, of a 15 minute city. And it looks like you pulled together your, your personal 15 minute city. Yeah, I actually pulled this together for a talk where I thought I was going to be doing a presentation and then I didn't have to. So it's never been used. So we can just say that I I thought this would be a good opportunity to put it in there. Um, But this was sort of related to I was going to talk about um, sort of the the joy that I find in in transportation and um, how like when you kind of plan where if you're you're considering like I went through the process of of. but home ownership recently. And, and one of the most important things to me was the neighborhood. And I think a lot of times people don't think about that as much. Like I, I think like conscientious city people do, but a lot of times people think about, you know, the granite countertops and the, you know, the, the parking spaces and the the features of their home. And they don't really think about the lifestyle and, and the kind of um, 15 minute city that it might be able to uh, for them. So the idea of the 15 minute city is that everything that you need um, should be accessible to you within 15 minutes on foot. And then beyond that, there's a little bit of a circle of being able to use active or, uh, public transportation to get to things a little bit further out. So I just sort of mapped the things I go to regularly in my, in my neighborhood. So you can see the little house, um, in the middle, around the middle there is where I live, but I have access to the river trail for recreation. There's ice cream, there's pubs, there's a bike shop, there's a hardware, small hardware store, grocery store. There's even a car rental across um, Pemina Highway. Um, And there's a BRT station that I can walk to. Um, Yeah. And there's, there's gyms, coffee shops, all of that. Like my curling club is even within this 15 minute city. So um, it was really important to sort of yeah, for me, it was really important when I was picking a place to live, but I think this is important as we're talking about the future and, and how to maybe even remap or rethink areas that are established and how do we make them better for people? How do we make planning better for people and less expensive, but also um, more joyful and, and more because one of my favorite things to do is like, yeah, just last night I was like, oh, I kind of want pizza. And I just like walked down the street and got a pizza and came back. I didn't have to be like, Oh, I got to get in my car. I got to pay for delivery, you know? And I think that, um, just even that act of walking can, can brighten your day a bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's so much fun. So, and, and how far is it to work when you, uh, when you jump on the bike and you commute to work? Um, so it really varies. And I think that sort of depends on like how fast I want to go versus how distracted I am. Also, (laughs) if I need to really get there quickly, I can get there in 15 minutes to 20 minutes on my bike. But I usually I'm, I'm, I'd say like actually slow is 20 quick is 15. So it's, it's pretty, it's, it's within that 15 minute city using an alternate route of transportation. And it's about the same, same for the bus, depending on the bus route that I would take. Um, whereas it's about a 40 to 45 minute walk. So it's just outside that comfortable walking distance. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, it, a 40 minute walk, if it's if it's a delightful day, you know, it could be like, you know, hey, I know I'm not going to be able to get my normal workout in. I'm going to I'm going to hoof it today. And and mm-hmm. I know that there's some cool stuff that I can see along the way. But what's interesting about that, you know, that 15 to 20 minute commute is it fits right into the realm of from a human behavior perspective of what people say is like their ideal commute distance Mm -hmm. you know they don't actually say zero commute they they actually like you know if they do enjoy a commute they they're like yeah that's that's like the the ideal amount of time and and it's kind of interesting because i do know some folks that only have like a five minute bike ride for their commute and they're like it's too short. <laughs> so it was too short. Yeah. yeah. You just like hopping on and hopping off at that point. Yeah. Like I'd probably walk, like I Would do walk. walk around the neighborhood a lot. Like I yeah. even have that debate sometimes when I'm walking, going to the grocery store because it's so close. I'm like, I guess I could carry more if I take my bike, but it's like, sometimes yeah. I actually go to the further grocery store in the nicer months because I'm like, Oh, it's, then it's yeah. more of an activity. <laughs> To sort of close us out, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is how do we get more people riding and specifically more women riding and people of color riding that maybe don't feel like this is for them and, and, and haven't traditionally done it? Mm-hmm. I think that there, and, and if I remember correctly, that might have been a sub theme in the podcast. I may be misremembering it, but in general, just that 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 concept. You know, what are some thoughts that you have, having been close to a lot of this and trying to normalize riding a bike, you know, for daily purposes? What, mm-hmm. what thoughts do you have on that? Yeah. So I don't know if it was a sub theme of season one, but it's definitely something I've been thinking about as like an extension. So I think you might've like read my mind. I didn't want to say it earlier because I'm like, oh, what if I never get to it? And I don't want to, you know, over promise under deliver. But um, this is actually an image of a woman I met. um, uh, Her name was, uh, her name is Sam Sam Rawit. And she's, um, she was in a group of women. She let me take her picture that we were teaching to ride a bicycle. So this is just after I spent about half an hour with her, um, just teaching her how to sort of get comfortable on it. And that's, that's actually a project of, um, of plain bicycle in Winnipeg trails that Leanne is, is heading is, um, it's, adult women volunteering to teach other adult women how to ride a bicycle. So it's giving women um, access to transportation. And the initial incarnation of the project was women from the, uh, from IRCOM in Winnipeg. And it's a immigrant and refugee resource center for, so people that just came to Canada and, um, and it's in an area in the inner city where there are like bike lanes. So it could be somewhere where they can have access to that transportation if they knew how to ride a bike, but it's intimidating because if you're going to ride a bike, not only like, I would say not only thinking about like the roads and the traffic and the bike lanes and learning all the rules, but it's also intimidating to just get on the bike and ride around a parking lot if you've never done it before and you're an adult. And, um, I think it's something we take for granted in, uh, in sort of like, um, (laughs) middle-class, you know, North American culture is that like, you know, my parents taught me how to ride a bike when I was quite young, but like a lot of people, like different cultures or just different experiences, different income levels, they just never learn how to ride a bike. So this program makes it sort of as accessible as possible. Um, and then there's also, I believe they have now integrated a work share program. So, um, you can do a certain number of volunteer hours to get a bicycle and, um, these bicycles themselves, having the Dutch bicycles are really important to this because in terms of like teaching someone how to ride a bike, the first thing is to get comfortable on it. And actually just like we teach them just to walk with the bike. So we put the, we use smaller bikes and we get them, the seats really low and and basically you're just like just walking with your feet and just like getting the feel of that. And then, and then you teach them to kind of scoot and, and, and just glide a little bit. So you work up to the pedals even right away. It's just sort of starting to get that feel and, and, and trusting yourself. So, um, yeah, it's, um, and sometimes you even take the pedals off if people are struggling or like it's, it's a distraction just so that you can get that feeling of balance. So I think there needs to just to get more people cycling, that haven't tried it. Like we need to have, have these lessons is sort of just taking that stigma that like, if you don't know how to ride a bike, like that's fine. You just 
came from different ex- lived experience than me. And, and, and you can, you can learn and you can build your confidence and like, we're going to support each other. And, and I, there's things, you know, I don't know. So it's like, it's not like there's, if there's any sort of something wrong with not knowing how to ride a bike, um, as an adult. Uh, but I think the other thing is just some of those things that we talked about earlier with, um, it just like the proud dominant culture of cycling is still like, you know, middle-class white men with these fancy yeah. <laughs> sporty bikes. And I think it's, it, it's, um, people can't see themselves in it. And that's something really interesting about the plain bicycle project is that, and I remember in, in maybe in the podcast, they did talk about, about this Anders and Leanne, when they were looking at the names of the people that registered, like, and I mean, you, you don't know exactly how someone identifies by just reading right. a name, but it did seem to be pre- predominantly um, traditionally at least women's names. So they were like, you can make an assumption that most of the people registering for these bikes were women and, and perhaps like people like myself that didn't see themselves in cycling culture until they started to see bikes like this. So I think that, um, if cycling is to grow, it needs to not just be one type of cyclist and you need to understand that it's, um, uh, there's, this this sort of simpler Dutch way of cycling is something that is a lot more accessible to people. It's a lot easier to ride that bike. You don't need any sort of special skill. Like I've actually never ridden a bike that's like a road bike where your butt's in the air. Like, I don't know if I yeah. could, like it's, it, that terrifies yeah. me. That terrifies me to have my head like going straight forward. So right. it's like, if that's all you're seeing and then you're seeing it in traffic, like no way. I'm not going to try that. I don't have a death wish. So, and then, yeah, the other thing is the infrastructure, right? So if you want people to cycle and feel comfortable cycling, you need to provide them space spaces to do that. And and I do notice that in Winnipeg as the infrastructure is improving, I do see that diversity on the cycle lanes is getting more diverse because I think that more people are feeling comfortable um, than, than when they had to go on the road. And that was my follow-up question for you was how is that process uh, coming along in terms of getting all ages and abilities infrastructure on the ground? Uh, it's a struggle. The struggle's real because there's just, um, I think why people don't like change generally. Yeah. So like they think, and people are very short-sighted and selfish. So it's like, it's basically a problem with like public um opinion on any any sort of issue like i think the city is just sort of especially winnipeg we have a mayoral election coming up soon so okay. hopefully we have someone that really wants to advocate for it but right. we we need someone to just be like no this is just like this is what's happening like i don't care that you're losing one parking spot in front of your house that isn't even yours because this is a public street like we need to rethink streets in that way too that it is they are streets for everyone like people who ride their bikes are just as important in the city as people that are driving their cars and um, it needs to be built. Like we're building, we are building bike lanes, but it, it is, it's a much slower rate than I think the interest in cycling. Um, and it's, it's the connection of the routes can be challenging. So now we finally have good routes going through downtown. Um, but the connection between the central neighborhoods where most of the people live and the that, that where the most mode share is and downtown is difficult. Like even in my neighborhood that has a high mode share in downtown, there's the bike lanes to get there. I have to go either on a sidewalk over a bridge where I'm not supposed to technically be, or I have to go on a bridge with cars, which is terrifying. So it's, that's going to prevent like 50% of the people from even trying because it's just not, um, it's not safe. So it, it's growing, it's growing slowly. I wish I could be more optimistic about it. Yeah. We did recently actually just last week get two streets that they changed to 30 kilometers an hour streets yes. permanently. Yeah. Um, so that makes them, makes yeah. them safer routes. Um, and, and I, I'll, I'll be interested to see how that, how that goes. There's one of them. It's interesting because the one that's more of a neighborhood, there's one of them that's kind of like, it's a bunch of mansions along the river. And, and mm-hmm. I, I was biking down there the other day and cars were still speeding, even though there was 30 kilometer signs, like very frequently, but then the other street, Wolseley, which is a more of a neighborhood street. I think before they put those signs up, there was takeover, like people just they ri- they're walking in the middle of the street all the time. So it was right, just sort right. of a natural, natural progression. Um, so, so maybe with some more of that, we'll see, we'll see how it evolves. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I do think that, um, the speed in which we implement the infrastructure needs to be a little quicker, a little less hesitant. And the leadership needs to understand that this is just how you build a modern city and there's no way around it. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. 
And I think that's a great place for us to wrap this up. That was fantastic. Well, thank great. you so Thanks. very much, Aaron, for joining me once again on the Active Towns podcast. It was such a pleasure having you. Thank you for having me. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Erin. Uh, I always have such a wonderful time talking with her. Uh, she's so fascinating. She's so energetic and, uh, and positive. And uh, uh, again, if you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up, uh, share it with a friend, leave a comment down below. And, uh, and hey, and, and if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the Active Towns channel. It really does help out a lot in terms of bringing additional visibility to this content that I am producing and uh, trying to grow the culture of activity movement. And another thing that you can do to help support my efforts are to become a patron on the Active Towns uh, Patreon page. Just head over to patreon.com slash active towns and YouTube can become an Active Towns ambassador <laughs> for just as little as $1 per month. Uh, believe it or not, it just all adds up and helps out a tremendous amount. Uh, also, what you can do is pop on over to the Active Towns store and take a look at some of the uh, Streets of River People swag that I have out there. Uh, again, don't make a ton of money on this uh, uh, stuff, but it all adds up. And again, anything that you can do to help support and spread the word about the Active Towns movement uh, is greatly appreciate it. Well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Mm -hmm.